Good morning, I'm Bren. Welcome to my cottage garden located here in New South Wales, Australia. It's a absolutely beautiful spring day. Although having said that, it's a little bit windy and there are a few dark clouds in the distance. So hopefully the rain will stay away because I want to do a garden harvest. After which we will have a chat about the advantages and disadvantages of direct sowing. And then finally, I wanna give you an update on one of the flower beds, which we haven't looked at in quite some time, a number of weeks, and there's a lot of great growth going on in there. So please just sit back, relax for a few minutes, and let's get into it now. I just grabbed a basket. It may not be large enough. We'll see how we go. I'm gonna start off today over here in the raised garden bed area, where I have some carrots, beetroot, spring onion and potentially radishes and turnips. I haven't really decided yet what I'm going to cook with all of these which might be a great idea. I should probably have some kind of plan in mind but what I will do is I won't get all of these cooked until tonight so in next week's video I'll show you a photo of what I created with these goodies. They were the spring onions in here. I have some beetroot. I'll have to poke around, see if I can find a decent sized one. Oh, there we go. How about I grab this one? Oh, I love pulling these out. It's so satisfying. Oh, it's not enormous, but it will do. I'm gonna pull out one of these fennels, but before I do that, look at these bluebells. They're kind of hidden under the fennel fronds. How pretty are they? They're definitely very spring-like, aren't they? Okay, oh, this one may have, probably should have been taken out a while ago because it's got really big and it might not be the best in flavor. I don't think this little basket is big enough, so I won't bother bringing it around with me. I will just go and harvest and then place everything in this spot once I'm done. Next up are some carrots. Let's wriggle this one out. I still don't have a huge amount to pick. They're a little bit on the small side still. I'll probably wait a few more weeks and hopefully they will fill out. Not that I'll be harvesting them today, but look at this. These are my broccoli and cauliflower plants. Remember I kept on saying to you that I, I didn't think they were going to amount to much because they were just constantly under slug and snail attack. Well, they are little troopers because they seem to have passed that little bit of an obstacle and now they are looking wonderful. Just check in there to make sure that's not an egg. No, it's just a little blemish. I wish I could say that everything is growing well here, but it's not really the case. This is where I have a lot of the radishes and the Japanese turnips. And unfortunately, a lot of them are starting to bolt even though I have been checking to see if they've developed underground and they're still not quite ready. Maybe I'll be able to get something out of here. Will I pull one out and just see what happens? These are the um, watermelon radishes. <laughs> oh, let's have a check. Oh wow, that is so small. <laughs> That's definitely not ready to eat. Oh, I don't know. I'm gonna leave them in here a bit longer. I'm not really quite sure why they are bolting. Probably I didn't sow them at the right time and now the weather's too warm for them. But at least someone will enjoy them. Maybe the bees and other pollinators will like these flowers. I've got plenty of Russian kale here. It is almost the end of season for the kale. A lot of the plants down the back are starting to go to flower. I'll show you them now. You can see it's starting to happen here with this purple curly kale. I still can harvest them, but I'm thinking I may remove this plant very soon to make room for some summer crops. I grab a few of the celery stems. Oh, I've got so much celery as per usual. I always grow so much every year. But it does come in handy when you're adding it to stews and stocks. I've got a bunch of peas. 
finally to finish things off I'm going to pick a bunch of rainbow chard. This isn't a bad little garden harvest. I'll bring all of these inside now and whip something up with them a bit later on. Today I'm going to direct sow these dwarf or bush variety bolotti beans. While I open this packet to show you what they look like, I'm going to chat to you a little bit about direct sowing. And that pretty much means where you place the seeds directly in the soil. It's a bit windy here today. Directly in the soil where you want these plants to grow. Oh, got one. I'm sure most of you are familiar with them, but that's what they look like. Here in my garden, any seed that I have started off in my greenhouse, I could, in theory, direct sow them if it were the right growing conditions. For example, if it was the optimal soil temperature to sow those seeds out here in the beds, or if it was in the correct location, getting the ideal amount of sun, or if the soil was the right type, whether I needed sandy soil to get those seeds germinating, if it needed loamy soil. I'm now going to go over some of what I believe are the advantages and disadvantages to direct sowing seeds. Direct sowing can be less work because you don't have to set up all your equipment like your punnets and get your seed raising mix ready and your hose and watering can to sow into cells first and transplant out in the garden later. It can be a, a lot cheaper. All you're doing is you're popping a seed straight into the soil, just two simple things. As opposed to if you start those seeds off indoors, you may need to invest in maybe a little greenhouse or some kind of dome to protect the seeds and create a warmer environment. You know, you've got your punnets, your seed trays, your seed raising mix, all of them can add up. Those little seedlings that you have started off indoors can come under a bit of stress when you are transplanting them out into your garden. I have mentioned before that, you know, you should really be hardening off your seedlings just to get them acclimatized to their new growing space. However, I mean, there still is a bit of a chance that these plants will become stressed. And the other thing to note too, is that when you are pricking out your seedlings to put into your garden beds, there is a possibility that you can damage some of those roots. And those two things combined, you know, root damage, a bit of plant stress, can make them a little bit more susceptible to disease and pest attacks. Whereas if you direct sow the seeds, they are in the same location from beginning to end and the root system is just a lot more stronger, robust, and the plant is healthier. Well, I guess that's kind of the theory behind it. I mean, I'm saying all of this, but I do, as you know, <laughs> start a lot of seeds off in my greenhouse. And there are reasons why I do that. So let's just chat a bit now about the disadvantages of direct sowing. One of the biggest disadvantages when it comes to direct sowing, for me at least, is that it's not great to direct sow every single thing you wanna grow because there are some plants, especially those summer crops like chilies, capsicums and eggplants that have quite a long growing season. And if you were to wait until the ideal conditions to get those seeds germinating out in your garden, you may not have a very long period to get those plants grown, established, and to the point where you are harvesting from them. So to avoid any disappointment, what I do is I give myself a little bit of a head start. And this is where sowing seeds in punnets comes into play. Because if I can get those seeds sown six to eight weeks before my last frost here in this part of the world, I will be able to have some decent sized seedlings or little mini plants ready to go into the ground when it's the ideal conditions out here in the garden. Direct sown seeds, in my opinion, can be very prone to pest attack. 
I don't really like calling them pests, but you know, birds for example, they will see a lovely fresh garden bed and they'll come in and scratch around looking for little insects. They'll disturb your seeds or they may even go and have a little peck at them and eat them too. Another pest which I definitely don't like are rodents. Say if you sow some larger seeds like okra or beans or peas, they come in, dig them up and eat them and you either get a very patchy germination where you have to re-sow or you may not get any seedlings pop through that soil at all. Also, if you don't sow them at the right time, what tends to happen is all of the weed seeds in that soil may germinate before the actual seeds that you wanna grow pop through and show their little sprouts. And then it just becomes one massive mess and that can be particularly difficult for new beginner gardeners when they're still trying to learn or to identify what particular seedlings look like. It can be incredibly frustrating and it can just be really disheartening too. Let's go now and sow these. While I'm doing that, I'll share a few tips with you. Here's the garden bed that I have ready for the bolotti beans. Whether you are direct sowing or sowing in punnets first, it's always really important to read all the information and follow the instructions on the seed pack. To ensure I get a decent crop of bolotti beans, what I'm going to do is I will over sow. In each hole, I'm going to sow three seeds. If they all germinate, that is absolutely fantastic and all I need to do is thin them down to one plant. However, they may not all germinate or as I said before, they may come under a bit of pest pressure. By putting three seeds in there, it really does increase my chances of having at least one plant in that spot. If you are direct sowing the crops that vine, like say cucumbers, watermelons, melons in general, pumpkin squash. What you can do is, like I just did there with the beans, you can put three seeds per mound or per little area. And then also a great tip is just to mark that spot with a stick so you know where to water. It's a bit of a water saving tip. Um, and it actually really helps to have that stick there when the plant gets really large because you will know where the root system is located, where the start of the plant is located. So you can just water there directly rather than the whole area because watering the whole area, say from overhead, can bring on fungal diseases and it does waste a lot of water that way too. Okay, they're all sewn now, so next what I need to do is just cover them up with some of this wire frame. Hopefully now, this will stop any birds scratching them up. I'm going to put a couple more around here just to cover the whole patch. I'll give you an update on how they are growing in about two weeks. I probably actually may even be next week and we'll be able to see some of the shoots pop up. The cuff flower beds in this part of the garden have exploded in growth since I showed you them last. All of the gladiolus and lily bulbs are up. I made a mistake here in this little spot. When I planted these gladioli, they went into the ground as corms. So I buried them and there was no foliage on top. I thought I had marked out where they stopped so that I could put in the next lot of plants, which are these straw flowers. And obviously I got it completely wrong because now I have some straw flowers jumbled up with the gladiolus. <laughs> I'm of two minds whether to dig all of these up and move them. I may just leave them there and see how these two plants grow together. I mean, the gladiolus will grow into tall spiked flowers while underneath this will kind of bush out. And hopefully by the time I harvest these blooms from the plants here, I'll be able to remove them and then these will be able to take over the spot. I'll just leave it as an experiment, see what happens. I have started to plant the row behind them too, but we'll come back to them a little bit later because I want to show you what else is going on in here. I have all of the umbrella type flowers. So this is the Ami Fisnaka. 
I'm probably killing that pronunciation. And then behind them, we have some of the um, chocolate Queen Anne's lace. And behind them, there are some of these dill plants. Now I have planted these very tightly together, but I find with these particular plants, the tighter I pack them together, the flowers will be a bit smaller. And in the case of these dill, plants the flowers can get absolutely massive probably a bit too big for flower arrangements so putting them a bit closer together will just mean I'll get a smaller bloom that's more ideal for the bouquet. A, another cut flower that comes to mind that you can use this technique with where you space the plants a lot closer than what is recommended on the seed pack is sunflowers and it's really quite cool actually I think if you plant the sunflowers closer together the actual flower heads will be smaller and you know with a bit of practice and you know trial and error you will be able to figure out the ideal spacing to make those heads the perfect size that you're looking for when you want them for you know bouquets this week i planted a lot of the cosmos that i had in the greenhouse so i had the light pink and the dark pink and i also popped in a few of the herbs that i have growing here uh, that i had purchased as well like this one which is a sage plant and then over here is a pineapple sage i have one of these in the front garden i did have a massive bush of it um a couple of years ago but it died back on me so you know just putting a fresh one in to keep it going and then these are the gara plants i love these one year one of the plants got massive and it was just so stunning it's like little butterflies flying above the stem so pretty Beside them are these carnations. Would you believe it? It was only about two days ago that I weeded all of these beds and look at the amount that have come back. Like honestly, maybe I missed a couple, but has that, this one like, has that really grown in two days? Maybe it has if I had done what I just did there and I didn't get the root system out. That's the thing when you take out weeds. If you don't get that root system out, they do grow back very fast. So I like to make sure that I get it all out so there's no chance of any kind of regrowth. The sun's come out for a second. These are all of the Napita or Catmint. I buy a lot of this brand. You can purchase them from Bunnings or um, a lot of the garden centres, independent garden centres have them too, like Tim's Garden Centre in Campbelltown or the one I go to in Tarmore, Tarmore Garden Centre. The Renaissance Herbs, I love these, great value for money. I think they're around six, five, six, seven dollars each. The root system on the plants is wonderful. And as you can see here, I showed you these maybe three or four weeks ago and they have doubled in size. They establish very fast. These four plants are the sweet marjoram, which I purchased reduced to a dollar each. They were looking very pruney and sad. All I did was I gave them a good chop back before I popped them in the ground and fed them with some seaweed solution. And as you can see, they have grown back wonderfully. This will be a fantastic herb to harvest. I'm also gonna use the sweet marjoram as a cut flower because the blooms on it are so pretty. It's like a purpley pink color. They've got really lovely long stems. And actually, in fact, there's a lot of herbs that you can use as cut flowers. So it's quite interesting and it's something I really want to explore this season. Beside them are all of these Persian crests put on lots of growth too. I feel like a broken record, but I'm just so delighted with how well everything is growing. And I'm telling you, all this rain we're getting has really been helpful. Now I've taken a good few steps back. So they were the two beds that I showed you just for a bit of reference. That's where the straw flowers, gladiolus and lilies were. And over there, we're just taking a look at the Persian crest. As you can tell, this area is extremely weedy and I have to do a lot of work on it. But my priority is getting those plants in the ground, as is what I've planted in this new row. I haven't finished it all off yet, but I've planted maybe half of it. In here are mostly celosia plants. 
these were the ones that I had over near the greenhouse so I've got a mix of Celosia cristata which I showed you last week which are the cone Celosias I'll put the proper name up on the screen and then in front of them are these lovely the Carway ones or yeah Selway white and the Selway salmon I have about five of those plants in here in front of them I'm not sure if this is going to work out because I have done this before with these gonfrinas and they tend to die off if I put them out too small like this but I've got more growing in the greenhouse so I'm prepared to take that chance these are gonfrina light pink oh I can just imagine imagine them all in flower with all of the gorgeous celosia blooms behind them like a rainbow color it's going to look really beautiful in here I can't wait to see it all in flower so I do still have a bit of space to play around with here. I've got maybe four meters by 90 centimeters in this bed. And then over there, it's a little bit wider and a bit shorter. I would say about 1.5 in width and length. I'm just trying to figure it out now, three meters in length. I'm thinking I may put some dahlias in there. And in here, I really want to bump up the amount of fever view I have so I'm thinking maybe continue this row with fever view well that is it for this week everyone thank you so much for sticking around till the end don't forget if you enjoy this video to please give me a thumbs up that really helps to support my channel and if you are new here welcome please I would love if you would consider subscribing um, I post a video every Friday just a general garden update Full of tips and tricks I'll be doing garden harvests of both edibles and flowers there's a lot coming up this season and I really am excited to share with you all well until next Friday thanks so much for watching and happy gardening